Hello, and thank you for joining us for another inspiring message from Journey Church. To learn more about our ministries, please visit us online at journeychurch.org. Now here is today's message. Pastor Donald Schott, a warm Journey Church welcome as he comes to the stage to talk to you on Philippians chapter 3. Well, if you've uh, been here for maybe the past few weeks, or more importantly, if you haven't been here for the past couple of weeks, we're going to be in a a book of uh, uh, Philippians, and last week, Pastor Eric uh, Eric Leister, he he was sharing with us, and he started off in in Philippians chapter 3, and so we're going to pick up in uh, verse 12 today, so if you have your Bibles, uh, if if you're kicking it old school today, go ahead and open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, If you got your iPhone or whatever, iPad, you go ahead and go to version and and, uh, get on there and follow along as well, but man, I'm going to talk today about our identity as a believer and what, what we're supposed to look like, at, you know, as Christians. I mean, we say we're Christians. We say these things, you know, and we sing these songs, but we're going to talk about what the identity of a believer is like today, you know, and this is going to be a very difficult passage, okay? It's a hard passage to preach, okay? And I don't say that apologetically, but I, I just really want us to get this passage today. So as we're looking at the, I want, this is the first thing that I want us to understand that Apostle Paul, he's, he's writing this letter. He's actually writing it from a jail cell, okay? And he's writing this letter to the Philippian church. And he's writing this letter to them. And he, so he's writing it to Christians. So who's he talking to here? He's talking to us. He's writing this letter. He's writing to Christians. And this is the context of the day. And he's writing this letter because there's two types of professing believers. There's those who say they're a Christian. And then there are those who walk like they're a follower of Christ. And, uh, you know, we're really more identified by the things that we do, aren't we? More so than even our own name. Like if you have a neighbor, and let's say, for instance, that neighbor is a policeman, and you're talking to someone else about your neighbor, well, you typically don't talk you know, about his neighbor. You just say, my neighbor, the cop, you know, or my neighbor, the lawyer, or whatever the case may be, or maybe even a personality. You know, if you got, a, if you got one of those neighbors, it's kind of like an impossible neighbor. You know, one of those neighbors, you wish their company would just like, you know, ship them off to another planet or something. <laughs> Did anybody have any neighbors like that, you know? You know, so if you, you know, sometimes we're identified by our personality. And sometimes even our neighbors may even say this about us. They say, you know, my neighbor, they say they're a Christian, but you know what I saw them do the other day? So, you know, we're known by what we do so much more than even our name. And here's what I believe. I believe this all my heart. I believe that if we're Christians, if we're really walking and following Jesus Christ, if we're doers, if we're actually pursuing the mission that God has given for each one of us as individuals, then it should be pretty easy to pick us out in a crowd as a Christian. Amen? So what I want to do, I want to do something just a little bit different this morning. I want everybody right now, go ahead and bow your heads, close your eyes right now. And I want you to think about two things. I want you to go to the Lord and it, it, just settle down. Man, if you're in the middle of a text, email, or whatever, just go ahead and just set that aside. I want everybody just to settle down and concentrate on yourself and concentrate on God. And I want you to ask God to do two things during this time today. I want you to ask God to reveal to you the things that are in your life that are not pleasing to him, the things that you need to get away from your life. And then I want you to ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit to help you to overcome those and get rid of those things out of your life. So ask God right now, to reveal that to you and ask him to help you with it right now. I'll give you a couple seconds and then I'm going to pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord, and God, we are needy people, Lord, and we are people, man, we're prone to do the wrong thing and even the things that we don't want to do, God. So many times, like Paul said, that's the thing we find ourselves doing. So, Lord God, today, as we open your word, as we look into your word, God, would you, would you make your word like a mirror to us that when we look in it today, God, we see ourselves just as you see us, God. And, Lord, again, would you help us, God, through the power of your Holy Spirit to get these things out of our life and live a life that honors and glorifies you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know what? When, when God got a holy apostle Paul... You, you know, you could see this a clear change in his life. I mean, you know, here's this guy. Is this, this is what he was known for. He was known for just dragging Christians out of their home, kicking down the front door, dragging them out in the streets, just beating the heck out of them, maybe even killing a few of them. 
throwing them in prison. That's what Paul was known for. In fact, his name was actually Saul at that time. And then one day, man, he's, he's headed off to Damascus one day. He's on his way to Damascus. Why? To do the same thing. He's going to drag some Christians out of, the, out of the house, beat the crap out of them and kill them or whatever, drag them into prison. And then, you know, that's what he's going to do. But, but something happened. On his way there, man, he's just kind of cruising along. He's probably just going, like, yeah, I can't wait, man. It's going to be awesome. And also this bright light shines from heaven. And God says, or Jesus Christ speaks to him. And, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He says, don't you know it's hard to kick against the goads? And like, you're probably, what the heck's a goad? Well, goads are like sharp sticks that they used to prod cattle with. And Jesus said, don't you know it's kind of hard to kick against those things? In other words, he's saying, don't you understand that you cannot stop my will? And then in that moment, Paul received Jesus Christ as his Savior. And from that moment on, he was never the same. And you can read about that account if you're a note taker in Acts chapter 9. And then in Acts chapter 22, you read another account where Paul's sharing this with, in the public there. He's sharing his testimony about how his life used to be, what happened to him, and then how his life was afterwards. And he also shares it again before King Agrippa in chapter 28. So there was a clear difference in the identity of apostle paul nobody could term apostle paul as the guy that he used to be but now he was a servant for god and you know last week we were in a, like i said we started off in, in uh chapter three and when eric leister was talking last week and this verse came up uh there's just something that jumped out at me in fact i had already had my message pretty much finished and then that verse just jumped out at me i said wait a second man I've kind of written a message that's really something that I wanted to say. I don't think it's what God wanted to say. And God clearly showed me what it was that he wanted me to talk to you about today at that time. And so look at verse 10. We're just going to kind of recap last week just for a second. He says in verse 10, he goes, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And here's what it is, man. This, this just jumped out at me. This is so crazy. That I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Now, he says right there that I may share in his sufferings. I mean, isn't that crazy? You know, I'm not suggesting that we get on this kick, you know, of suffering. You know, I'm not advocating that, you know, we start suffering and all, the, all that, you know. But what I am saying is don't avoid it. Because here's the thing. If you're sharing Jesus Christ, you know what? You're going to share suffering. If you're talking to people about Jesus Christ, you know what? They're going to reject their, your message, and they're going to reject you. And so you will suffer if you're out there following that call that God has for you. Now, here's the thing, though. This may be some good news to you. I don't know. You can avoid that suffering. Just don't tell anybody about Jesus. Just kind of go out there and just kind of float in the rest of the crowd and, you know, kind of live like they do, and you'll fit right in. No problem. You won't, you won't suffer anything. But here's what we do to avoid suffering. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but this is, these are some of the things that we do. We, you ever notice how we set up barriers because we don't like to suffer, so we'll kind of set up some barriers in our life, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to tell people about Jesus, so, you know, I only do that when it's safe, like maybe in these four walls, you know, where it's safe or maybe at work when everybody's already talking about it. Or what about this one? I'm only going to love people until, it, you know, it, it, just to a certain extent because after that, you know, it's probably going to hurt too much, so I'm not going to let anybody in, you know. And, and so sometimes we do that, and, and sometimes, you know, we, what about tithing? You know, I'm only going to tithe to this, to this extent or until I can't make this payment or until I can't maintain my level of comfort. Or, you know, what about the old standard? Probably all of us have used this one before. This, so we've all probably put up this, this little boundary right here. I never talk about two things. Politics and religion. You know, as Christians, maybe we need to give politics a pass every now and then. But talking about Jesus, I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Yeah, I mean, you know, if we set up these boundaries, we're, we will avoid suffering. But in doing so, here's the thing. You're going to miss the mission that God has for you. That's the thing. And in the late 90s, um, Stephanie and I began to feel the call of God on our life into full-time ministry, and we didn't even know what that meant at the time. And, man, before we knew it, man, we had a business that was, was thriving, and we, we sold our business. We sold our house, and it was the funnest thing, man, because I got to watch everything that I had ever worked for in my life, all my toys, all my fun stuff, you know. I got to watch everything that we had worked hard for all of our lives go right out our front yard in three different garage sales. 
And everybody says, oh, man, you really sacrificed for Jesus. I'm <laughs> like, no, that was fun. I mean, that was a blast. I, lo- I love to do that. And the crazy thing is we, when we got on the plane at JIA, we were sitting on the Delta flight, and we were sitting there waiting to take off, and, and the plane had just pulled away from that gate. You know that little sensation you get when the, when the plane first starts pulling away from the gate? You get that little, that little nudge there. When that happened, we looked at each other, and we just started, like, I can't believe we're doing this. This is crazy. And we looked at each other, and we said it both at the same time. We went, burn the ships. See, that was our way of saying, there's no turning back. Man, it's burn the ship. Man, this thing is, this thing is on. And, and uh, you know, on the mission field while we were there, though, it was, it was so easy to stay focused. It, it was. There weren't a lot of distractions here. I mean, we were in, man, we were in the sticks. I mean, we were in a remote part of Costa Rica, and uh, there weren't a lot of distractions there to mess you up. And, and, and so it was so easy. But the thing about it was that the whole time that we were in Costa Rica, this feeling really, I never got over this feeling that I was a foreigner. I wasn't from there. I didn't belong there. You know, I was a gringo in a Central American country, you know. I didn't belong there, you know. And it, it was just kind of a funny thing. I'd wake up in the mornings going like, I don't belong here. I'm like, why am I here, you know. And it's like, oh, yeah, I'm on a mission, you know. And, and it was so awesome. But here's the thing. I bet nobody here woke up this morning in Jacksonville, Florida, thinking, why am I here? Oh, I'm on a mission. We don't wake up thinking we're on a mission, do we? Honestly, and it's so hard for me to to wake up in Jacksonville, Florida in the morning and think that I'm on a mission. Why? Because there's all these stinking distractions all the time in our life. And here in Jacksonville, that's just the way it is. And, you you know, we've made this place our home. We feel that we're from here. And so we, may, we lay down our roots, you know, here in Jacksonville, Florida, and we wake up in the morning and go, ah, oh, my home, my living room, my bed, you know, my, 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 my car, oh, this is so, you know, and we lay down those roots, you know, and it's so hard to get distracted. And, and that's the exact same thing that God tells us not to do. He tells us not to make this world our home. And it's just so hard to wake up and, and, and realize that. And you know what? Before you know it, we lay down our roots so heavy that if we were all to be honest this morning, I bet nobody looks forward to Jesus coming back. We don't really want him to come back. Why? Because we've made this world our home. Everything that we love and everything that's near and dear to us is right here. And we really don't look for Jesus Christ to come back, man, because we've made this world our home. And if you were to be completely honest with yourself, are you really in a hurry to see Jesus Christ come back because you're so in love with him or have you made this world a home and you set down your roots and you kind of wish he didn't come back right now you see when you read paul's writings that we're getting ready to do you know and i've been praying about this a lot honestly because this passage that we're getting ready to dive into this could so easily go right over our heads and i don't mean in an intellectual way i mean because this is so far away that the way that most of us live today this is so far away from the way he lives and 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 paul this is all he thought about was this one moment in time this one moment when he crossed that line and he got to see jesus christ face to face i mean his whole life was being preparing for this one moment in time that that one moment that most of us we don't even really ever think about much and it's weird sometimes you know we'll sing songs we sing a song a while ago that you know, you won't relent until you have it all. Do you know what that means? That means God's not going to do squat until he has all of us. And that's what this passage is telling us today. And so last week, 